Welcome back. Our final session for the day is presented by Dan Golding, titled The Humour in Interactive Sound. Dan is a composer, writer, lecturer, host of radio show Screen Sounds and film music podcast Art of the Score. He is best known for his soundtrack to the hilarious title Untitled Goose Game and is going to talk about how comedy and music can work together. Over to you, Dan. Thank you to everyone for tuning in and to uh, the people at High Score and Games Week and Aparam Cost for having me. It's um, I really love this event and uh, I'm so excited to be uh, speaking to you all. Um, before I begin, I'd, uh, I know there was an acknowledgement of country this morning, but uh, I would also like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, and uh, that uh, I um, give my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and that this land uh, was never ceded and always was and always will be uh, Aboriginal land. So yeah, as uh, Cameron said, uh, I'm a um, composer. I um, do music for uh, games, for a couple of games that I'm going to talk you through today. Um, but I guess I also just wanted to flag that I do a bunch of other stuff. Uh, my day job really is I'm an academic. I research and teach uh, mostly film, um, but film music in particular is a real area of interest for me. Uh, and I also host a radio show uh, with ABC Classic all about film music. And so I guess... The reason why I bring that up is because, you know, I think all of that really um, informs the music that I do and how I approach all of it in that I'm sort of coming to game music as, well, maybe a little bit of an outsider to some degree, but uh, certainly as somebody who has a lot of different kind of interests and perspectives to bring to uh, game music. So when uh, I was um, very, you know, uh, kindly asked to uh, do this, I started to think about what it is that uh, my games have in common. I've done, yeah, the, the music for Untitled Goose Game, probably most well known, uh, and the Frog Detective series, uh, and Push Me Pull You, uh, which was House House's uh, first game. Uh, and I realized that really there's a couple of things that, uh, you know, unites all of my games, that all my games have in common. Uh, and the first is that really they're all animal themed. Uh, <laughs> and yes, Push Me Pull You does count because aside from the weird sort of human headed, uh, double bodied monsters, uh, there is a dog mode. Uh, which means that it definitely counts as animal themed, I think. Um, so aside from doing exclusively uh, animal themed music, I think that humor is obviously the thing that unites all of my games together. Um, or laughing, I suppose. I mean, Push Me Pull You is a kind of inherently funny game to play with people. There's a lot of yelling and shouting. It's a four player local multiplayer game uh, for anybody who hasn't played it. I, you know, I think that, um, you know, Frog Detective is obviously very much a comedy and Untitled Goose Game, uh, as I'm sure um, many of you know, is definitely a comedy. So I guess, yeah, I, I'm here to talk about uh, games and comedy or games and kind of laughter, I guess, uh, and music in particular. Um, and I guess this is interesting because, you know, historically, I suppose, uh, games and humor, uh, there was a long period over perhaps the first decade of the 2000s where there weren't many comedy games or, you know, um, overtly comedy games um, or games that were even really trying to be humorous in the same way, which is kind of interesting. So I'm, I'm as surprised as anybody to find myself uh, here. Um, most of all, because of this, <laughs> I'm not particularly funny. Uh, I don't think of myself as a particularly funny sort of person. Uh, I'm an academic. Uh, academics are, you know, probably about as uh, more serious uh, type of people uh, that you usually get. And so, uh, sorry, uh, if you're expecting a really funny talk, uh, I'm really sorry to disappoint you. But I also, I guess, for framing this talk, I kind of, I don't really like 
talks that give universal lessons that are actually just drawn from a specific experience. I've done four games now, and I think, you know, four games that work really well with their music and their humor, but I don't think they're universally applicable. Um, so I'm going to try and avoid talking about uh, the general and just try and keep things specific, I guess, to my experience and what's worked, what's succeeded, um, and possibly the lessons that can be drawn from that. Um, and I guess, you know, the other thing that I think I want to flag before I begin is that, you know, obviously there are different types of humor. I mean, one of the hardest things about writing music for comedy games or, or you know, working within games that are supposed to be funny or get laughter out of the player is that humor is really not a universal thing, um, or at least many types of humor are not universal. Um you know, you often have to really be in a specific sort of set of cultural circumstances or or be part of a specific culture to kind of get the joke, right? Um, and I think that what unites all of the games that I've done music for is that they're a specific type of humor um, and that they're they're funny in the sense that they want to welcome you in on a joke. I don't think they're mean games. Um, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of comedies about kind of um, punching down or making fun of, um, you know, things in a kind of cruel way. Um, I don't think these games do that. Um, you know, I always think of, you know, the way that House House Market Untitled Goose Game is sort of like, oh, no, it's a terrible goose, sort of like, it's a mild inconvenience, you know, and that's where the humor comes from. Um, rather than this totally destabilizing, horrible force, it's horrible in the sense that, well, it's, it's a goose. How horrible can it really be? Uh, I guess pretty horrible. So what I'm going to be talking about today is this, these four main points. I'm going to be talking about what makes music funny. I'm going to be talking about uh, the musical slapstick of Untitled Goose Game, um, playing with genre and frog detective, and laughing, I guess, with video music. I'm trying to um, bring all of those things together by, as I said, talking about a kind of video game humor and video game music that is designed to be laughed with, you know, not at, or to laugh at something. Um, we're kind of welcoming you in on the joke. Okay, so I want to start with a fairly bold statement, which is this. That music, much like myself, is not funny. <laughs> or at least it's not funny by itself, I guess. Um, I think this is kind of an, a, a crucial distinction to make um, that, you know, music... I don't think is is inherently something that's going to make people laugh, but it's the combination of music with certain other things that makes um, those things funnier. I'll provide examples of what I'm what I mean and what I'm talking about. So, okay, when we talk about music and humor, a lot of what is often talked about as funny music um, or comedy with music is quite specific stuff. Um, you can kind of almost draw up a chart of kind of the cliches of uh, funny music. And it's often um, music that is optimistic in some way or playful and childlike um, or mischievous. So, you know, you could go through a bunch of different things like uh, wrong notes are usually a, a very uh, sort of uh, common thing to put in, in quote unquote comedy music or funny music. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that kind of thing. Uh, staccato notes, um, usually like pizzicato on uh, on strings, this kind of thing. I hope that's coming through all okay. It's sort of clipping a little bit on my end, but um, even if it's not coming through okay, uh, I'm sure you get the idea. Or, uh, you know, the typical uh, things that are uh, really high or really low notes, so, you know, really high notes. or really low instruments, which, you know, really you could just bring that back to things that sound like screaming or things that sound like farts, basically. I think, you know, uh, there's some fairly uh, easy to explain reasons why those things are, are, are funny. Um, 
I think especially as well that it's outside of the vocal range of the human voice. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to make the cello, for example, inherently funny because the cello uh, has a range that's very much associated with the human voice, the singing voice, whether that, you know, is, is any kind of range that sort of the cello fits in there. Um, so to move outside of that to the extremes is kind of already, you know, pushing at the seams and making things funny. Uh, or what I guess I would call like light percussion, um, which can be things like this. I had a lot of fun putting these clips together. Uh, you know, that kind of like light comedy music that um, especially um, you hear in like sitcoms, especially from the early 2000s, I would say, you know, things like Scrubs where they almost like replace a laughter track, um, that kind of light, light comedy um, percussion uh, to something really obvious like uh, this, which is always quote unquote funny. Well, sometimes all of these elements are kind of combined together into, I guess, this kind of, you know, um, maybe an off-kilter march or uh, like a waltz. So something like this, right? But I, 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 you know, still go back to my claim before that music is not inherently funny because all of these things can be used in a really serious context. Um, even a sliding trombone like that, uh, the um, music, the classical music critic for The New Yorker, a guy called Alex Ross, who writes so beautifully about music. I really recommend checking out his writing if you haven't encountered it. He writes in this book uh, called The Rest is Noise, which is about the music, the classical music of the 20th century, about sliding trombones as being this kind of sign of modernity in orchestral music and you know not funny at all or you know even an off-kilter waltz, waltz or a march like the one that you just heard is used as a really powerful tool of kind of like political critique in the hands of a composer like Dmitry Shostakovich for example um, kind of, you know, yes, working within parody, but humor, it's not designed to be laughed out loud at, I don't think in the same way as we might expect. So I guess I'm just going to go back to this claim that music is not funny, but it is powerfully funny. Music is such a powerful tool in your game making tool set or your composing tool set, of course, when it's combined with a context. So in this case of video games, that's image, right? Or even action, I suppose, if you're thinking about what a player is doing. So it's about juxtaposition, I think, that music can be deathly serious in one context and incredibly ridiculous and funny in another. So um, I think I'm just waiting for my next slide to come up unless I've skipped ahead. Let me just... See, no. Yeah, there we go. Okay, great. So this is, um, I want you to imagine James Bond. This is a piece of J uh, John Barry music that I wrote um, just idly, uh, sort of John Barry style James Bond music, just because I was messing around. And finally, I have an opportunity to use it to prove a point in this talk. So imagine James Bond uh, going down a canal, the Grand Canal in Venice here, um, and that's very serious in that particular context. So think about that. Like, you see what I mean, right? Like, taking music really seriously, but in a the ridiculous context of having, you know, uh, a James Bond-style frog detective. 
changes the nature of the music. It's the juxtaposition. It's the relationship between the image or, you know, the game and the music that makes things funny, I think, inherently. So in that case, I guess we can talk a little bit about Goose Game. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things about the reception of Untitled Goose Game and the music is going through reviews, um, as is probably a, a bad idea to go through reviews and, and see what people say about your own work, but uh, I couldn't help myself. Uh, and to go through the reviews and see the way that, particularly with this game, reviewers kind of couldn't help themselves. They likened the music to a whole different range of um, previ previously existing film or TV influences generally. Um, so here up on this slide, I think you can see they're sort of talking about like uh, Charlie Chaplin, um, Buster Keaton, uh, Looney Tunes, uh, I think uh, Benny Hill is one of them, but there were all sorts of um, similarities drawn. Um, uh, other people, uh, particularly Americans, talked about the music as being like the music of um, uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, the children's TV show, which incidentally I've never seen an episode of. Um, uh, but in Australia, I guess it makes more sense to think of it as being like play school. Um, and I think that's really, really interesting um, to think about how this music, you know, how people related to this music in context. And I want to kind of pause on that Goose Game thought for a moment um, because I want to show you this very short film from 1895. It's one of the first films ever made by the Lumiere brothers. It's called um, La Rosa Arose, which basically means the water watered. Um, on some programs, it was also like called The Gardener. Um, and uh, I guess early on when I was brought on to um, work on the music for Goose Game, I immediately noticed that there were similarities between this Gardener and the Goose Game Gardener. Um, entirely unintentional. I mean, not that I think, you know, there's a problem if it was intentional, but it was totally unintentional. Um, and this, as I said, was an early film. It's kind of a film of firsts in a way in that it's the first, a lot of people argue that it's the first film with a storyline that's about 40 seconds long, um, that it was the first film with a com uh, sorry, the first comedy film. Um, it was probably the first film with a promotion poster. Um, if we really want to get uh, to that, some people even argue that it was the first adaptation because the plot is quite like a comic book strip plot that was popular at the time. Um, but I just want to play you this. And I'm going to play it to you in silence. Uh, and I just want you to think while you're watching it what the music should be like. Okay. All right. I think, you know, doing this exercise is really interesting because we all have our own, I think, impression of what music should be like, particularly for the silent film era. Um, there's a whole bunch of cultural connotations tied up with what silent film music was like. And actually, a lot of the time, especially before about 1914, 1915, so especially for the first 20 years of silent cinema, of film, we don't really know, actually, a lot of what happened musically in silent film, um, well, cinemas, you know, um, where uh, they were they were showing silent film wherever it was that they were showing showing silent film a lot of that stuff hasn't really been preserved or written down and there was actually probably a lot more um divergent types of um practice um than we even still know about today but i think it's an interesting exercise to think about the different types of comedy music that there could be for this scene today um, we would probably find if a similar sort of skit was put on TV without the associations of silent music. Um, so if it was just a similar kind of, you know, uh, uh, standing on a hose, spraying a gardener in the face with water sort of um, sketch, say on a, a sketch comedy TV show, if there was music, it would probably be music that would 
create an overall comedy mood, a mood of humor rather than anything specific to the sort of frame by frame moment. So something a little bit like this, which um, I, I mocked up. Which, you know, I think definitely makes a certain impact on the scene uh, and certainly, you know, uh, gives you a certain sense of that something funny is going to happen right from the moment that the music starts. It's that sort of combination of, uh, you know, a lot of those cliches that I put on the previous slide about comedy music. But actually, I think what would happen um, and what you were imagining um, probably when I said what kind of music should play over that scene is something that reacts a little more closely to the on-screen action. Um, now, writing this kind of music is really hard um, and I gave myself a hard limit of 20 minutes to mock something up for this slide, so um, forgive me. Um, but uh, something like this, I think, etc. I even only did uh, about half of the, the, the film because it just takes a lot of time and effort to write that kind of music. Of course, um, for those of you who are musicians and composers watching this, you'll know that that type of music is called Mickey Mousing. And sometimes, um, in fact, mostly um, as a insult, it's called Mickey Mousing um, because it's kind of seen uh, as uh, maybe a cheap or a lazy way to um, write comedy um, that kind of is tied in super closely with the image. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've never really understood why it's kind of thought of as lazy because let me tell you, it's way harder to write the second one that you just heard than it is the first one. The first one took about four or five minutes of just doing the most cliched sort of ambient stuff and you don't even have to care about what's happening on screen whereas this you know like uh if i wanted to do it properly you'd have to be changing time signatures tempos you know constantly um it's difficult um but i guess the reason why uh that is is because there's this division i suppose between whether the music particularly with comedy should lead the kind of action should should um, become a focus in and of itself or whether it should um, uh, be something that just kind of uh, complements what's happening. And this is not a new debate at all. Um, I had to include this. This is slightly off topic, but it appeals to my academic sense of historical interest um, that this um, comes from um, a magazine uh which basically uh, the, it was called the moving picture and this was where a lot of the kind of norms of filmmaking and particularly film exhibition came from uh in the 20th century is because everybody was doing things differently there was no one way to show a film uh you know until there were trade publications like this where people started to say no this is the best way to do it uh, this is the way you can make the most money uh, doing things right um and they had this column regularly written by this guy called clarence e sin who i think was a music librarian and he was one of the first people to kind of like catalog different um pieces of music that might work uh for uh, silent film accompaniment and he really used this column to kind of codify the best ways that people should be using music in movies. Um, obviously, this is before synchronized sound. Um, so, you know, we're talking about pianists and such in, uh, in uh, a, a Nickelodeon or a movie theater. And I just wanted to highlight this bit from 1915, which um, hilariously, now that I get to it, I realize I should have transcribed in my slide because I can't really read that extract on my monitor here. But basically, <laughs> um, you can see, I'm sure you can see yourself on your end, that basically, um, you know, the, the end of this um, discussion is about, you know, don't think that the music, sorry, that the picture is there to illustrate your music. Um, you're there to accompany your music is to accompany the pictures right this kind of um very prescriptive like um the music is secondary to what's happening on the screen and that's where a lot of this i think you know a lot of this kind of distaste for mickey mousing comes from 
and especially because um, it is um, there to, you know, it, sorry, the, the phrase Mickey Mousing comes from animation, which has this link with silent film, and I think therefore goes through to video game music, which I'll talk about in a moment. Mostly through this figure, uh, this guy called Carl Stalling, um, who, um, you know, if you were really going to think about an influence on um, uh, Untitled Goose Games music, I would say the music of Carl Stalling is, is closest. Um, and Carl Stalling was a pianist, an organist for silent film. Um, he would improvise. He had a huge catalogue of pieces of music that he would draw on. Um, often musical punning, you know, so, um, you know, if uh, the film was set in, I don't know, Sweden, he'd play a piece of music that was popular at the time that had Sweden in the name just to get a laugh out of the audience, that kind of musical punning. Um, and then he was recruited by Walt Disney to write music for the very early Disney films. Um, he didn't actually write the music for Steamboat Willie, which is the first uh, Mickey Mouse um, sort of sound cartoon. Um, but he wrote music for a lot of the other early ones, hence this term Mickey Mousing, right? This overly illustrative music. And then um, after a couple of years, Carl Stalling um, and uh, Walt Disney um, had several big arguments apparently, uh, and uh, he left uh, to go to Warner Brothers, uh, where he um, basically Warner's started up um, Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies um, to, for him to work on. And so there's this incredibly close link between the frame of animation and the notes of music to the degree where when these cartoons were made, uh, animators and composers would get together to uh, literally compare like tempos, BPMs with frames. So, you know, to say like maybe if the music was recorded first, to say to the animators, okay, using the maths of the tempo of this piece of music and how many frames per second we're animating in, we know that on frame 16 of, you know, this minute, the beat will hit. And so your, your animation needs to lock in at that point, right? So incredibly, incredibly detailed, finite um, stuff, right? And so I think games, thinking about games and comedy, Games have the potential to be a real kind of successor to this. I think in, in some ways there is a real lineage between silent film, animation, and video game music, particularly, I guess, um, in, in the case of Untitled Goose Game. Because I think there's an element of slapstick. Um, and it's that that I the, the reviewers are identifying when they're talking about Charlie Chaplin or um, you know Benny Hill uh, in in the game's music, um, and you know I always love these these two little videos that are just um, videos that people posted. Um, I don't know either of these tweeters um, uh, of of what was happening in their in the games um, that they put online. Um, as their kind of snapshot of, of, of their experience playing through. And the goose music is just so wonderfully sort of, I think, using the system that we set up, which I'll talk about in a moment, is so perfectly commenting on the action in the same way that um, a lot of those Looney Tunes or, you know, Carl Stalling um, uh, types of approaches are. So um, just to super quickly play the one on the left. <laughs> and then the next one. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I love, there's nothing that makes me happier than seeing people post their own clips of playing the game and seeing the music work that well, 
you know, like there's no way that we could have really tested those exact sequences. They are unique to the player's playthrough um, in terms of music and in terms of the, the instance in the game, I suppose. And this is made all the more sort of complex because this is not music that I composed for the game. This is music that I adapted for the game and that I worked with House House. I mean, House House did incredible stuff in terms of music programming. Um, to have work in the game. It's pre-existing uh, music. It's by composer Claude Debussy, um, or as I'm extremely sorry uh, to um, Claude uh, to do this to him, but um, uh, it's much better, I feel, to um, to call him Debussy in these contexts because um, <laughs> uh, it's a terrible pun. Anyway, um, and, you know, these are the preludes that were written uh, between 1909 and 1913, uh, I think it was, a series of piano preludes. Uh, there's 12 um, in total, and we used uh, six of these um, across um, both of the, the books. So there's two books of preludes um, in this series. Um, there's, there's one. Uh, and we, you know, use these piano pieces that were, you know, you can see those dates, right, of, of, of 1909 to 1913. They're contemporaneous to silent film uh, and when people were using the piano to accompany um, those, those early pictures. So I think there's a certain kind of... Um, you know, a certain kind of fittingness there, which 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 is is really fantastic. But basically, look, you know, we spent a hell of a lot long time figuring out how to cut up these preludes um, to be used in the game. Uh, in the end, I mean, just with the first prelude, which goes for about two and a half minutes, um, I ended up cutting it up into, I think, from memory, it's been a while now, about 370, I think it is, um, little beats, um, little um, stems, as we called them. Um, they're effectively every beat, basically. Um, so just to give you an idea of um, that, I'm going to play you, you can see this is my setup in Logic. Um, I'm just going to play the first of these. Can you see how they're, I mean, for those of you who don't use Logic, you can see um, how there's four um, green squares. Well, there's, I mean, there's actually six, but I'm just going to play the first four on the screen of those um, green squares. And each of those are a separate audio file in the game, basically. Um, so just to see if this will work. So I tried to get <laughs> each of those squares <clears throat> to kind of flash as they played. So basically, um, there's two versions of um, each of those stems. That's really one of them is really forceful. One of them is not so forceful and much slower. And the game basically tries to figure out on the fly which of those stems to play, uh, depending on what you're doing. At any given moment as the goose um, and just to give you an idea i'll zoom out a little bit to just show you uh what all of those stems uh, look like in my um logic session so there's a lot right it's basically infinite um uh, sorry not in terms of stems but in terms of the performances that the player can get it's basically infinite i went through a lot of the technical detail of how this works uh, last year in a gcap talk which is on youtube um, and i don't want to just spend all of this talk replicating that so if you're interested in the kind of technical detail there um, then please check out that talk um, but yeah, basically as well, um, now we've got the really interesting challenge of releasing this extremely algorithmic um, uh, soundtrack on vinyl. And um, basically, um, yeah, like uh, we're trying to do that same sort of thing where some of it is um, uh, basically it's got um, two grooves. So when you put the needle down, um, you will never know uh, which of those grooves you're going to get. Um, now, cool, I can just see Cam in my window. Are we going okay, Cam, um, for time? Yep, okay. yep, awesome. 
I'll keep going. Okay, cool. So now I uh, just want to talk a little bit more uh, about some of the other music that I've made to kind of further detail this point uh, that I've been making. So Frog Detective, for those of you who haven't played it, is quite different. Um, it's another kind of comedy. Um, and I think, you know, it's much more around genre and expectations. Um, and it's about subverting those expectations of genre. Um, it's a detective sort of game as the title would suggest um but grace bruxner who really you know is um responsible for these games uh coming into being um did a great gdc talk uh i think it was last year about how these games subvert humor and about how to Detectives are uh, often really mean people who are good at their jobs, which are solving, you know, mysteries, but they're really horrible to other people in the process. Whereas the frog detective is uh, a really nice person who's quite bad at their job, but it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> so I think it's really funny then in this case for the music to not be in on the joke, basically, for the music to be exactly what you would expect if you were going to have that regular unchanged unsubverted genre um so here's just the main theme over the the first trailer for the game just to give you an idea of how that works in practice um cool So, yeah, I think you can hear there how, like, you know, I really approached it. Like, I was writing, you know, music for, like, Agatha Christie's Poirot or Miss Marple or something like that, you know, um, and not really wanting to have the music wink at the audience. Um, I've got another scene here, which is one that was worked on quite closely by um, all of us in the in, in the game, um, Grace and Thomas Bowker as well. Um to make this sequence where in this this is the second one where a um figure who haunts the first game is finally introduced in the second game and that is lobster cop and i'm going to play the music to this and although it seems like the music is winking at the audience literally in one moment i actually never approached it like that so um here it is <laughs> I mean, so like, you know, it works in that comedic context, I think. But it is funny because of the context. When I was writing that music, I was thinking of composers like Lalo Schifrin. I was thinking of Quincy Jones, Henry Mancini, who I think is such a huge influence on my work in the way that Mancini really gets inside a genre um, in a way that works for whatever project he was working on, um, but doesn't sort of talk down to that genre often. Um, yeah, especially like in his Peter Gunn work. And then finally, this scene from late in the second game, 
maybe some spoilers, not massive spoilers, where there's this very mysterious scene at the end of the game. And to this, I returned to straight film noir, thinking of Max Steiner or Adolf Deutsch, who wrote a lot of the classic film noir, um, like, um, uh, you know, The Big Sleep, um, these sorts of films, uh, and did this. You know, really thinking of those clustered thick chords that you often find in those film scores and, you know, the brass mutes and that kind of thing, you know. So, again, taking the music as seriously as the game will allow, I think. Um, and so, basically, you know, I, I wanted to bring this all together. I was researching a lot about comedy and music in, in the lead up to this talk to try and solidify my thoughts about it all. And I found this great lecture by, of course, who else, you know, Leonard um, Bernstein. Um, and he has this great lecture about comedy and music. But he says this. We come to the central point of all humor that all jokes have to be at the expense of something or someone. I don't necessarily agree that all jokes have to be at the expense of someone. I don't think that's true, obviously, as most of the talk kind of suggests. But something, I think, is an interesting point. Something has to be hurt or even destroyed to make you laugh. A man's dignity, an idea, a word, or logic itself. I mean, you can see a lot of those... Um, you know, Looney Tunes cartoons, logic is the thing that's broken. Um, and so what's broken in Goose Game is a sense of tranquility in the town, a sense that uh, the human animal hierarchy is broken, that a quiet day in the village can't, you know, can't be disturbed by even a medium sized kind of waterfowl, right? That this is the kind of logic that's broken in the course of the game. And a sense of status as well from the music. Status is such a great thing to break when you're trying to make something funny. And I think the inclusion of those classical pieces of music implies a certain kind of highbrowness, at least, that is broken by the game. Um, same with Frog Detective. Expectations about genre are broken. Expectations about how serious detectives should be and how mean they should be are broken uh, and broken by the music kind of upholding that side of the bargain and the genre uh, as well. So um, I just wanted to end, and this is literally the last thing, by kind of showing you, um, well, an, a kind of an exclusive, really. It's... Uh, only been played once before, and that was to some RMIT students well before the game came out. And it's kind of a failed experiment, but it's an interesting experiment nonetheless that I thought would be fun to show you all as kind of something that's really, for all intents and purposes, never been seen before from Goose Game. And that was that originally we thought it would be funny to end the game with a kind of piece of music like you would hear at the end of like a British um, soap opera or a sitcom, kind of a, a kitchen sink style drama about, you know, a grey little town uh, with grey weather, uh, you know. And uh, we came up with this, you know, and I've put in the kind of faded images over the top that you would probably see in that kind of, um, in that kind of sitcom. So it was very different and this is what it originally sounded like. <laughs> Thank you.
it just kind of fades out. So I'm gonna gonna end it there because I think you get the point. But you know, I think we made the decision not to include that. Uh, the end credits are just you know one of the Debussy preludes, and I think it was definitely the right decision in that that was. I'm very fond of that joke, but it's a joke in a way that the rest of the game doesn't have. I think the rest of the game is much more this kind of like situation happenstance sets of comedy that is this wonderful collision of the goose and the village and you the player. Whereas that's kind of like a hey, do you do you get this joke? Have you have you seen these kind of sitcoms? Have you have you like watched the British office, you know? Which I don't I, I don't think it would have been the right move, but I'm really glad to have been able to share that with you as an example of a kind of humor that didn't quite work out in, in Goose Game. But um, that's really it from me. Um, I've gone, I think, a couple of minutes over time, so thanks for bearing with me. Uh, I think maybe there's a little bit of time for Q&A if questions have come through. Oh, there are absolutely questions, Dan, and thank you so, so much for that presentation. Um, <laughs> It's always just really exciting to see how people kind of come at projects and um, and also the way we dissect them afterwards. I always think that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I need to start with what was the most upvoted question um, when I uh, launched into this spiel, and now it isn't. So thanks, Internet. Um, <laughs> but the the most the most upvoted uh, question uh, so far is honk. <laughs> okay, we got that out of the way. <laughs> Um, we've got a, we've got a question from Robert Webb. Uh, why not Gustav Mahler? Um, insert goose pun here. Um, yeah, and I, I guess more nice. broadly, I'd, I'd kind of like to chat to you about um, why Debussy, like why specifically the preludes. You've kind of talked about kind of the link between silent film, but obviously there's a lot of other pieces that kind of, kind of sit in that similar sort of space too. Yeah. No. I Absolutely. I mean, if we wanted to go full silent film style, um, I, I can find no evidence that those preludes were actually used in silent film performance. I'm fairly confident they would have been just because of the nature of the timelines and stuff like that. And the fact that Debussy's music is, you know, it does turn up in silent musicians' catalogues and stuff like that. But I, I mean, you know, I've looked not super hard. I haven't gone to an archive or anything, but you know, there's no super <laughs> evidence that that, that that music was used for silent film. Um, but it is the right era. But you know, we could have gone to other pieces if we if we you know were really trying to like be historically accurate or something like that. Um, but basically, the the short answer is that um, House House had already stumbled across uh, one of the preludes that's used, the first prelude mm. that you encounter in the game. Um, uh, I think. Nico Disseldorp, who is um, well, he's he's the the programmer from House House um, largely, yeah. um, and he's the one who did the brilliant music program um, to help um, the that musical system come alive. Um, he had just been, I think, listening to music and heard that mm. prelude turn up and sort of made a mental note, going, "That's kind of funny. That's a funny piece of music," um, and. Yeah, I mean, we we put it in the trailer. Um, we recorded a, a, I recorded a version which was used in the the first trailer for the game, which was really quite successful. Um, but it was just supposed to be music on the radio, um, you mm. know, like that you pick up. Um, and the music that you pick that that plays from the radio in the game eventually is quite different. I wrote all of that as kind of like '90s pop tunes that you might hear on the radio at that point. Um, but originally it was the Debussy that turns up on the radio and then we released the trailer and there were a whole bunch of people kind of in the comments and on social media going like, wow, I can't believe the music reacts to what you're doing as the goose. Uh, that'll be amazing in the game. Uh, I can't wait to see that. And like, of course it didn't do that, um, <laughs> at that stage. And so we we're all just kind of, you know, I remember we had a meeting like two or three weeks later and we we're sort of like, yeah, we should probably figure out how reactive music works you know like we we, we should probably do this and yep. so that's you know that's that's how it kind of came about mm. so there's a um a beautiful segue in here actually um coming in from michael um so how much work was put on the programmers versus the composer in regards to the inter in, uh, interactive soundtrack and the timing of it so yeah. once you've figured out oh we're doing this whose problem is that <laughs> 
I well, it was. I think it was a collective problem. I mean, I wasn't <laughs> doing the the yeah, I wasn't doing the programming. Um, you know, and I still you know have to give so much credit to Nico for for figuring that out. But I was doing, or at least we were collectively figuring out the logic of how to split this piece of music and how to make it reactive. I think that was almost probably the biggest problem was like trying to figure out how to solve the problem rather than even yeah. the, like the implementation. Like once we figured out in principle how the problem was going to be solved, it got a little bit easier from there. So I think, yeah, it was right. it was a matter of like me chopping up those stems into different versions and seeing whether we, you know, what, what it was like implementing them into the game. Um, I think, you know, originally I did one stem which was like, 16 seconds long or something like that so imagine if you did something naughty in the game as the goose uh but you'd been you know really quiet it would have to wait 16 seconds for that next like naughty stem to play right which is just not yeah. gonna work um no. so yeah a lot of that it was more like yeah it was like problem solving i'd say as a group um mm more than a technical problem, which would have divided it up to any one of us, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, totally. Well, I suppose figuring out how responsive you want any audio interactive audio to be is like, honestly, the, the, the biggest like elephant steak to eat out of the whole elephant. I find that yep. was, that was a weird metaphor. I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's been a day. Yeah. Yeah, like I think, yeah, once you've got the outlook on the problem, it really kind of helps you kind of go, oh, okay, well, we can break that down into steps now, but it's mm. getting to, it's getting to that, like, oh, yeah, how are we going to solve it? Yeah. Um, so Donna asks, did you use virtual instruments or record with real artists? And um, um, is that difference different between your games? Yeah, so for um, Frog Detective, it's 100% virtual instruments. And that's an aesthetic choice, actually. It's because I think there's a kind of slight plasticity to the virtual instruments, no matter how good they are, that I think kind of suits the game. I mean, the game's visual style um, is fairly kind of flat and, and, and blocky in terms of its colors, which I love. Um, and mm. I think that using virtual instruments rather than real performers kind of suits that vibe a little bit. Um, yeah. Definitely. The um, Goose Game was uh, a virtual piano, and I think, you know, just because of the way that I cut everything up, up into those individual stems, um, it's just the only way that that could have been possible. Um, I think, you know, totally. it would have been similar to, like, making my own uh, virtual instrument or sound font if I'd asked a pianist or if I'd got a piano and recorded every single note like that separately. That, that would have been... Um, yeah. Yeah, real, real tough. Um, but Push Me, Pull You, yeah. um, the first tour that I did, is almost exclusively um, real, like real instruments. Um, and that's all me. Um, and it's all me cool. with the errors deliberately left in, um, which is, again, an aesthetic choice because that game, you know, mm. it kind of feels childlike in its silliness. And so I wanted to get the sound of... Um, an orchestra of kind of kids who didn't really know what they were doing, but were really enthusiastic about doing it. Um, and you can't do that with virtual instruments, I don't think. Um, so it's got all of my own playing, um, all of my own mistakes. Like, you know, I obviously wanted to get the best take or polish it up. I wouldn't even rehearse mm -hmm. before recording myself um, for a lot of these. In fact, <laughs> the, the piece of music that's in the PlayStation 4 menu, like the, the menu before you actually launch the game, that is mm -hmm. a piece of music that I played on my melodica recorded on my uh, voice notes app on my phone literally the first time I ever played it. Like it was me going, oh, I've got this idea. I'll record that. And then later up through, you know, a very long process, that initial recording where I'm so clearly fumbling over the notes and sort of going, oh, I wonder what note comes next, um, sort of improvising, that ended up not just in the game, but literally the first thing you hear when you, you know, get it on, on PlayStation. So I'm still kind of astounded uh, and a little bit in love with that total messiness because, again, you just can't really get that with virtual instruments. So, yeah. Totally, and I, I, I swear Melodica must be on the the funny instrument list somewhere 
just for something that inevitably, so. yeah, inevitably sounds like some kind of horrendous kazoo given in ego or something. Um, I've just oh. offended every single, single Mordica player in the universe so well. Um, <laughs> Peter Show asks, how did you meet House House? Great question. Um, I met House House, uh, and this is why I guess I find it weird that I've now got this sort of parallel career in making music for games because I met House House when I was the director of uh, the Free Play Independent Games Festival here in Melbourne. Um, I think um, I'd invited them to maybe come and show Push Me Pull You Off at one of our free play events. Um, and certainly in the, it ended up that, I don't think, it was, no, it definitely wasn't the first time I'd met them, but we, we were just kind of hanging out in Fed Square um, because as part of a free play, we'd turned Fed Square into a giant lounge room. We'd put down a couch and a, a rug and set up like a lamp um, to play locally made indie games on the big screen in Federation Square. Um, and that day we were just kind of chatting and I, you know, just sort of asked like, what are you, what are you going to do with the music? Um, mm. cause you know, we, we, we were there literally for hours just kind of watching people play the game. Um, so we just got to chatting. Um, and mm. I think, you know, I didn't do a premeditated pitch of here's how I think the music could work or anything, but, um, mm. I sent a few ideas and one thing led to another and that's how it happened and so yeah this sort of like um parallel career i was a game games journalist i suppose for a little bit before that as well so i was sort of in and out of the game scene without ever actually making games uh and then started making music for games i guess mm. magic and i think this kind of ties back to what you're saying about um goose as well is that and and maybe as well for us like a kind of a running theme throughout today is um about finding collaborators and joining in together to solve problems. Um, and yep. that sort of very organic relationship, I think is super important. Um, Definitely, and so, yeah. so beautifully Melbourne. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Dan. Um, as I said, it's, um, it's excellent to have both you and uh, your your guest called Degussi because I I want, I want that pun too, um, yep. to join us and to, to talk about humor in music, in games, um, which is excellent. So thank you very, very my, much. My absolute, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me along. And thanks to everybody out there uh, watching. Yeah.